I, Pokemon Crossroads, and this is my Pokemon story. Welcome to As the Pokeball Turns, where we interview people about their experience with Pokemon. My name is David Hernandez, and today I'm joined by the owner of Pokemon Crossroads, Mikey. Mikey, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be on. I'm usually I'm typing, not talking, so this is new. Definitely. And, you know, you wear so many hats that people are going to find out. You know, you're the owner of Crossroads. You do judging for English Paris, I believe, for TCG and VGC, right? Yes, and uh, Go tournaments, too, as well. Oh, you run goats, so you do the whole three. Yeah, I I do whole dreaming circuits at my uh, Pokemon League, so it's Wow. Fun. How do you, like, balance the time to do all that stuff? Because that's a lot to handle. By not playing the game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, usually when I judge those events, I tend to be on the side when the computer. So I don't get to play the car, the car game as much as I like to, but I usually try to have a schedule saying, okay, first of all, is this game tournament. There's only so many Sundays in a month, so I try to condense them to be like certain Sundays. Meanwhile, we have a tournament every Sunday, but I have other league leaders to help run those tournaments when I'm busy with the other tournaments. But it's like crazy enough to do R3 them, and then, hey, that's my fault for doing too much. Well, it begs the question, so what made you want to start hosting these tournaments? Because a lot of work goes into them, and you don't get paid, I assume, right? I get compensated. There's a difference. One means I'm not an employee. The other one means I am an employee. Okay, but, so you get something out of it. Yeah, I get, I get something out of it. Um, Especially since for the last few years, I've been doing lots of regional judging, where they compensate us there. So it makes sense that I compensate the people who help me. I don't get to play the card game as much as I like to. Do I? But how I got into it is back in 2011, when I started playing the card game, I saw this guy who was running the pre-release events. I thought, oh, that'd be cool, dude. I would love to do one of these things because it's so much fun. People come to them, they have fun, they're happy, and go, okay, I like to spread happiness as well. So... I went to my local league, and from there, I was really good at being there every Sunday until the point they said, hey, we want you to come as a professor. And then from there, they said, hey, we want you to go ahead and win tournaments. And the program became more open with who can win tournaments. So I decided from there, it was like to the point where, like, now I went in the league instead of being one of the league assistants. And now I get to win the tournaments every Sunday and get to do this and that. Like, it started off like, hey, we need somebody to do TCG tournaments. Now we need somebody to do the video game tournaments. Hey, friend, I do doing Go. Can you do Go tournaments now? Yeah, I could do that. You know, for me, it reminds me of when I used to play basketball. And mm-hmm. I'd always watch people playing. I'd be a scorekeeper. I always mm-hmm. had that itch of wanting to be on the court. Do you have that similar kind of feeling when you're a judge and you see people playing TCG? Like, you'd rather be, at times, you wish you were kind of the one playing? Sometimes, but I think everybody who got to my position eventually had this one spot where they, want, they were really competitive at one point in time. And then they decided to step back to give back to the community or saying that. I think I did go through one of those in the early X5 phase where like, I wanted to be really competitive, but I was having bad tournament experiences. I wasn't doing well, and I had a nasty feeling like I wanted to do better. But out of that tournament, I decided, I sat back going, do I like this feeling I have where like I get really competitive and I get really down on myself? But it makes me happy to do, right? And what makes me happy is to win these tournaments for other people to have fun and like enjoy themselves because I really don't like that feeling that Mikey gets when he gets upset at like a bad news streak for that day. It's like, I get this game, but not good enough to play it. And if I do want to play it, then hey, maybe I have a short tournament day so I can say afterwards I could go play with my regular league. Or sometimes we have a regular Sunday where like, hey, there's no tournaments that I need to run officially. So I can run my unofficial tournaments and then say, yeah, I'll get to play today. So yeah, I try to find times for me I could play and not feel bad. Like, I wish I could play. And if I want to, I live in one of the biggest cities in the United States where we have like over 20 leagues. So if I really, really want to play, I could just go on non-Sunday and like say, hey, I hear you play Pokemon today. Let me sit down and play some Pokemon today. If I get that itch, there's places to get that itch scratch. It sounds like TCG is kind of your way to compete in Pokemon. What is it about TCG compared to the other ones like VGC and Go that got you hooked and kept you interested for so long before you became a judge? That's hard. I, I guess saying it's the card actions is saying different. VG is like the more exciting game to watch. But to play is kind of like the same thing. Like, you got the regular mainstays, like, oh, this team has a 
Rapid Strike Urchifu, or this team has XYZ Pokemon, they do this. With the TCG, there's a bit more freedom on like what the cards get to do because like Urshifu does something different in the TCG than compared to the video game. Or let's say um, your fairy Pokemon doesn't do good in VG or in Go, but has a niche in TCG, for instance. Like one of my favorite cards is Clink Clink. It's not great in VG or Go, but at one point in time, it was a good card in the TCG. So it gives a chance for different Pokemon to do different things or has it gives them a chance to shine, do something special. Like just a different outlet. There's a different outlet to play with these Pokemon and characters that you like that you may not see often in any of the other games. Now, it makes sense because, you know, with VGC and Go, usually there's confined meta within maybe 10 Pokemon. Mm -hmm. And that's usually how it is for not only just one generation, but multiple generations. But with TCG, because y'all have rotation, because y'all have, you know, the cards aren't restricted by their stats, but restricted by whatever Game Freak decides to create for the TCG, you get to see different Pokemon shine that you normally wouldn't in the other branches. Fair to say, also, like, it changes every three or four months because a new set comes out. VG and Go tries that. Every couple of months, they change it to like, mm -hmm. tweak some moves. They do this and that to make some Pokemon a bit better or worse sometimes. Or video game, they have their different regulations as well. And they change every three or four months too. And they try to do that, but like, it seems that the TCG does it better. Like, oh, yeah, we're going to just go ahead and put a new bunch of new cards out there. Some of these cards would be great. Some of these cards are going to make some decks better. So it's always changing. There's like, you can't take a break. If you're playing this game constantly, you can't take a break. So it's really interesting. It is a money drain sometimes because you got to buy cards. But if you do smartly, you won't spend too much money. And the, and the TCG is like the cheapest of the main TCGs out there compared to Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh! So. It's amazing to see how much experience you have with all the different parts of Pokemon. Mm -hmm. But where did it first start for you? Like, what was your first experience with Pokemon? I always say this is a unique one because I found out about Pokemon originally via Science Magazine for kids. And they were, reporting, they were doing a report on the Porygon seizure incident that happened in Japan. And I was like, oh, I want to see this seizure incident happen too. I mean, I don't want, I didn't want to get a seizure myself, but <laughs> so I decided to watch it. I, I, I found out where the anime was being shown on TV. So I watched the anime. I begged my parents for like a video game. Hey, give me a Game Boy for my birthday and uh, give me a Pokemon game. And they gave me like Pokemon Pinball. So like I didn't get the real Pokemon RPG experience. I got Pokemon Pinball instead. Oh, wow. That's a unique one. Yeah. But eventually I did get Pokemon Red. And then like I got Gold version, then I got Ruby version. Never got any of the N64 games. I just con continues got each game from each generation to like until now. Like I just never stop watching the anime and playing the video game. I mean, I collect the cards as a kid, but I never played until like our college. Like, hey, I got some disposable income and somebody wants to play the card game. So I, I could play the card game with them. And then eventually I just branch out from there to be mostly involved in the card game now. But I do play the other facets of, of the game with the video game and go now. I'm intrigued. So what was it about that article about the Porygon? For those who don't know, so basically there's a banned episode of Pokemon to where Porygon was causing seizures over in Japan. Never came into the States, I don't believe. I don't think it ever got an English translation. Nope. But what was it about reading about that that intrigued you to dive into Pokemon? It's such, such an interesting way to get hooked into this franchise. It's just that a, 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 a cartoon. Like, you, if you like 9 and 10, you could think cartoons was a thing you saw, right? But the fact that this popular cartoon in a different country did something as immensely as putting like, so many people in the hospital... It's like, it's a morbid curiosity to me. It's like, <laughs> how, right. how happened? Like, how does TV, you know, a pastime that you enjoy as a kid and many others do, do at the same time, put so many people in the hospital? Like, what, what cost it? What's the science behind that? Right. And like, eventually, you know, you find out it's a flashing lights. But like, at that time, I found Pokemon going, okay, what scene in this show, in this episode, cost this happened? Like, I didn't know anything about like how did it happen, which Pokemon, I, heck, I didn't know what episode it was. I thought it was just like a random episode of Pokemon that caused it. I had no idea, but I want to know, like, what could be the cost of it? Was this a glint? Was this a sting? And, I mean, it turns out, if you don't know the full story, it was, like, missile hits, Pikachu hits the missile with a thunderbolt, flashing red and blue lights happen. And apparently, those flashing red and blue lights in that certain pattern just does something to your brain and just, bzz, so you just Yeah, because yeah, I remember I finally watched the episode when I went to college, and I don't remember what got me on there, but I was just curious, because I was like, it was that episode I never saw, and it was a Safari Zone that I never saw, mm -hmm. one. you know, the one where Ash got all the Tauros. Yeah, but I finally saw the Porygon one. I'm like, I was doing the same thing to you. I was trying to figure out, pick apart which scene, like, which one caused the seizures? Because, you mm. know, it didn't affect me, obviously, but it was just so intriguing. Yeah, and I don't know what they did. It's something in the young mind of a child that is not, because it's not fully developed, it does something to them. As mm. adults, it doesn't affect adults as much. I mean, you could tell I probably read into this a bit more. I'm still here. Time. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're good. But, um, but still, it does something to the children's mind and saying that. Like, the adult mind senses 
is more developed, it does the chances of it happening to an adult is less likely. I mean, I don't know if the other version you saw, they slowed down a bit. I know, I don't think I ever re aired, but I know some places may have some. I heard and this is all now I hear like deep rumors, but I heard like now that I've been uploaded to the unofficial sites, it's been slowed down, but so it won't happen again. No, no, I know, I know, no, no, I guess call, we can call it the distortion world, yeah, the distortion world. No, the my social world, they have some copies if you know, you know, <laughs> yeah, but no, my, no, now I, I confuse me with saying else. I, I, I also used to be really into the anime at one point in time too, but uh. Uh, but they had done to the older episodes because the older episodes, in order to reduce the same thing happening again, similar effects where you have flashing lights have been slowed down a bit. Mm -hmm. Well, won't happen again on reruns. The Porygon episode is forever banned, but these the older episodes and episodes after that has a silver flash effect, and this pretty much fed the whole anime industry in Japan in general. It was common to have flashing lights at that speed, but after that episode with Pokemon, they pretty much made a mandate saying, "Nope, any flashing light has to be slowed down to ensure that our children are safe." It was a big thing. It was a huge incident. I mean, but like I said, back when I was 10, I had no idea that was, this was a thing. I was just like, oh, more curiosity. So, Mikey, you know, when it comes to the games specifically, what generation of games is your favorite? I love Gen 5. Every so often, if Gen 5 gets an inkling of attention, I would say, hey, Gen 5 remakes are confirmed. It's a joke. I make fun. It's a joke. I make fun of pretty much anybody who says X generation confirmed, but Gen 5 really liked as a story. I mean, all of my generations have something I love because of story-wise. Gen 5, I think, had a great story. They did something different. Is the inkling of Pokemon slowly coming out of its Japanese sphere? Because pre-Gen 5, it was like every region was based off of a part of Japan. So it was really cool to see what they did outside Japan. I really like this different story they told using N and the characters itself. A other fairy region, a other fairy generation minds was Gen 7. I just really love the Sun Moon games. Pacific Sun Moon. Ultra Sun Moon can be shoved aside, but <laughs> I just love the story that they told in Sun Moon with Lily and her family and, and all that stuff as well. I mean, that almost brought me into tears. Gen 8, as much grief as it gets, is high. It's like in the top five or so. I think Gen 9, our current generation, is really good in themselves. I mean, it comes to like what they did with the whole alternate branches, like the illusion of choice between the three branches of do you follow the legendary path, the titan path, do you do the team star path? Do you do the gender path and the characters he created for each path was really good and how they converge in the end to make one whole story. I really do like what they do with stories. I mean, it comes to my opinion here, those three generations like have the best story overall. And it is a simple story, but it's a really good story for, in my opinion, that I just love to, like, if I had to replay those games again, I can replay those games again and again and like still enjoy what they give out. I said, Gen A is like probably like four or five, but like those five, seven, and nine are always like in contention, like who's the best one, which is the best generation out of those three. And they're always like shifting between one, taking top one each time. I will say for Gen 5, besides the storyline, because I did love that, I really loved how they pushed the visuals for that game. Yes. Um, one that always stands to me is I think it's Costella Bridge, I think, mm -hmm. to where you're going on the bridge and you kind of see the city in the background. And you just see the screen moving and it blew my mind. And I was in college and I'm like, this is so great. And I just kept going back and forth just to see it over and over. Like, I love the story. Don't get me wrong. I've talked about the story to end. But that's the other thing I've never talked about when it comes to Gen 5 is I love those visuals that they really push the boundaries of how much they can push those pixels. I think I think they were still pixels the last generation for pixels, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. They were doing a weird high. They were trying to do 3D models without doing 3D models. Yeah, and that's you. Right. Skyway Bridge is such a the walk on Skyway Bridge is such a breathtaking view because like you, they were really trying to push the limits of the DS. Gen Five was the first time they every generation always was on a new console, quote unquote, every kind of Game Boy Color and Game Boy itself. But as the first time they have gone back, well, okay, I guess the Game Boy Game and Color are the same console. But that was the second time they get to redo do a other generation on a, the same console. They take the lessons from Gen 4 and apply it really hard to Gen 5 to like, if this is going to be our last DS game, we're going to really push it to the brink. And they really did push it to the brink because like those games are beautiful on that console itself. Like we had everything looks like, is this really 3D? Is this a preview we could see in the next generation games on the 3DS? Things like that. And like, I do love like the white, the, the black city and white forest. Those are beautiful scenery, scenery sets. And Castle Review at the, at the Pokemon League. All those, like, they, that is the seedling. That is, like, the little seed of what was going to be Pokemon in the, for the next 10, 15 years, in my opinion. And if you want to play these games, you, they can be yours for $200 a piece because they are not cheap. I surprisingly bought them for my uh, fiance and her niece a couple of years ago. And they, you could find them for, like, 50, 60, I think, $100. 
best. Oh, there's still hope. There's still hope. But like I said, this was a few years ago, so maybe not anymore. But if you try hard enough on eBay, you could find them for decent prices. GameStop as well, if you're lucky. But this is one of the reasons I wouldn't mind remakes of those games anytime soon. Because I think those games need to be replayed by current generations. Especially since it's harder to find. They were pre-3DS era, so you can't get them on like a fancy eShop. So those games are stuck on cartridge. Like if you before the shop, the 3DS shop went down, you can download anything from Gen 6 to Gen 7 easily. And now with the eShop or whatever they call it on the Switch, you can download Sword and Shield and the DLC and Scar and Bite and their DLCs easily. I do think it's, it's a real crime that we don't have access to those older games pre Gen 6. And I'm hoping that the Switch Online service be great for those games, be really hard for the DS games or just remakes in general. So let's talk about Pokemon Crossroads. Let's talk about what is, you know, Pokemon Crossroads for those who aren't familiar with it. So Pokemon Crossroads is supposed to be a good old hub to like see different fan works, like either fan art or podcast works or comics. We try to be a good hub for all that stuff to be found. Like there's other sites, there's SiriNet. That's your number one place for news. We can't, com- nobody can compete with them. You could try, but in the end of the day, if you're going for news, SiriNet's your place to go. So when Crossroads was made, we decided to focus on just fan works. Let's focus on things that people would like to go to for fan stuff. Like, oh, I want to see a new comic. Where can I go for a new comic? Crossroads be it. Oh, I want to see a cool video. Crossroads be it. Podcasting? Crossroads. Let me go po- Pokemon Crossroads for just see some cool fan works in general. So that's the idea of where Pokemon Crossroads came up to be. And that's the idea that I'm constantly trying to push and find new ways to do. And, and now, like, what, 10 years now? I think we've been Crossroads been, been out for. Were you there from the initial beginning as well? Yes, I was there from the initial beginning. Crossroads came out from a website called Pokemon Elite 2000. I'm not sure you met, you heard that website before, but it's a, it's been around since forever ago. I started there as a regular forum member, and then they had the, uh, back in the P2K, we're going to call it P2K because that's the acronym they used. They wanted to focus on the website. The webmaster was kind of stepping back, and the admin team at the time said, hey, we want to bring back the website for P2K. They noticed my work on a blog that I used to have. I used to have a One Piece blog back in the early 2010s. And they said, hey, we noticed you write for One Piece. We might doing some news and some articles for P2K. I said, yeah, I could do that. I could write. Writing is fun. So I wrote articles for, for that. Eventually, um, the admin team and the owners wanted to do two different things, the, but the owner wasn't too keen on it. So from there, we branched off to make Crossroads, where the idea was going to be just a place for the fandom to come together and share the work. And then I went to be working on the forum side and the, I eventually you could call that Discord as well. But I'll be fo- focusing on the website itself, providing articles. And eventually I pretty much just climbed the ranks from like basic writer to editor in chief to now owner. And if I have a team that, if I have a team, then they'd be writing other articles, things like that. I really need to get a team back in. You know, Pokemon News is everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know how Joe from Serena or the, can does it, but he does all that news, but that news is a lot. And I also want to do other things as well. I can't do all news because it's kind of boring, the news. Like, <laughs> right. The news is great, but there's other sources for the news. And I want to get back to that main core ideal of, hey, look at this cool video that I found. You want to watch it too. It'd be, it'd be interesting. Or here is some great podcast that you want to look into. Or here's a cool comic. Things like that. One question I want to ask was, y'all started the website based on just fan art. Mm-hmm. What made y'all want to focus on that part of Pokemon, that segment of Pokemon, just for fandom? It was just saying different. Nobody else was covering the fandom in 2014, 15. It was like, it was always focused on news. Like, what's going to be the next big leak? What's going to be this and that? It was really leak culture or leak or like news focus. Like, oh, have you heard about this interesting project done by a team called Niantic called Pokemon Go? It's like, oh, Go News, Go News. It's like, okay, but what about the fans? Because like, they've been keeping Pokemon around for forever. Like, it always been, I always felt like it's an interesting thing to watch because there's always the fans pushing things out. Like, have you heard about Peekaboo? Have you heard about this and that? And then when the internet exploded, when people got on the internet, they're like, oh, cool. Let me, ta- let me talk about my idea here. Let me do this and that. Oh, I have a cool piece of art. I have a cool piece of fan fiction that I want to share, right? Pretty much fan community that been pushing Pokemon to where it is today to the point where like now fans are doing actual official stuff for Pokemon. James Turner, he was not on the original Game Freak team, but eventually he worked to be on Game Freak to ma- be the art director for Soul and Shield. Or the social media people. They were fans at one point in time too. But now they get to run the show on Twitter and Instagram. To the point where they draw out memes. Only the community we know. 
but it's so cool that Pokemon fans are able to do so much where they are pushing Pokemon in both professional sense and fandom sense. Like we are on both sides of the aisle now. I always feel like we need to put a spot like on the fans itself. That was one of the things that kept me on Pokemon Crossroads for so long is that I want to push the idea of the fans themselves because hey, you deserve attention, right? I identify with that because that's how I started my podcast. Similarly, I wanted people right. to tell their stories. That's kind of cool. And that's what I love about your podcast as well, because like you're, I know this about me, but your podcast is so interesting because this is the idea that I had years ago. Like, how can I talk to fans directly? Like, what can I do to help bot like them and what they do in the fandom? No matter how small it is, like maybe they don't do a comic, but they've been Pokemon fans since like 2015. What kept them in this fandom for so long? I have an idea, but I just need time. <laughs> One day at a time, as they say, right? You need another, you need another Mikey. You need to multiply yourself. Yeah. So talk about I, learning double team. I have. It just, illusions don't work as well as physical Mikey themselves. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. So what is it like to see Pokemon Crossroads start from the early beginnings to what it is now? Like, how has it been to just watch its transformation and its growth over time? It's interesting because, like, if I ever look at my articles, it's interesting to see where, like, these ideas that, like, okay, I'm just going to work on news. No, I want to do something to help promote fandom. Because, like, we, we have art writers, we have different beat writers. But to where it is, like, now, it's, like, most of this is what I've been doing. Like, oh, I want to feature videos because nobody's talking about videos. Oh, I want to feature uh, fan art because I want to feature on fan art. Oh, podcasts. Nobody's talking about podcasts. It's really interesting to see where the site has come along since then. The news is a thing, but I'm not focusing on news. Like, okay, maybe I should talk about the community today because that's big enough news to mention. But here's this cool video about NPCs in Generation 3 and how crazy I'm back you doing. Or here is this cool piece of fan art that I saw. Here's this meme of the ESPN guy. Nobody's talking about, about the ESPN guy talking about Mewtwo. And like, how oh, Stephen that? A. Smith. Yeah. And how, how was a fan reacting to that? Where the point is, they made a bunch of fan art about it. Like, here's Mewtwo like, playing with the bomb James. Like, did anybody ask for that? No, but it's fun, and I think people should, like, see it. I think that's always I would think. Remember I post saying about, about the fans? I was going, would someone want to see this? Yes. Let me go ahead and post this online somewhere. It's like social media, but now there's a full website for it. So, you know, you, you alluded to, like, the Pokemon podcast, and that's how we met, you know, because, you know, I'm a podcast myself. How do you keep up with all the Pokemon podcasts? You're just not doing Go. You're not just doing TCG. You're doing anything and everything Pokemon podcast. I don't even know how many podcasts there are anymore, but I don't. I can't. It's impossible. Not, not with the job I have now. Maybe the job I had like 10 years ago, I could have, but it's impossible to keep up with them all. But it's nice to have a big list. Like, there is an article on Crossroads about getting out review, but give a review to your favorite podcasts. And while that is a great way to dig for reviews, it's also my master list of podcasts I listen to. So I, I keep track of. Like, okay, let me see they did a new update. Click. Oh, no, you haven't updated since like two months ago. Let me go back with that. But the way I keep up with it is just like, okay, I listen to a bunch of podcasts that I can. Like, I check up on them every few months. Like, let me listen to an episode here. Let me listen to an episode there. It's a lot of them. Some are inactive, but the hope is that one day they come back and like, hey, look, this one's back. And I love that I could put a spotlight on a fandom that I think needs a spotlight, but doesn't get enough talking about. What is it about the podcast that leads you towards it compared to like maybe YouTube? The on-the-go aspect. You can listen to whatever you want. With YouTube, you have to focus on it a bit. You could download a YouTube video if you want, but the podcast, the grab and go aspect of it. You can listen to it at the gym. You can listen to it as you drive. You can listen to it as you clean the house. With YouTube, to me, it already feels like there's a visual aspect to it that you need to put full attention to it, or you just not giving respect to the creator that they deserve. Like they put work into the background of the YouTube. They put work into all that stuff. And if you're not watching that stuff, why are you just watching on YouTube? When you, can listen, when you have the podcast on your phone saying that, you can take and grab and go. And at different points in my life, I was always grabbing and going somewhere. Like, oh, I'm going to drive my job while I was doing driving all over the city. Let me just put in a bunch of podcasts, listen to that as I drive. Or I play Pokemon Go. I mean, listen to a GoCast. Go as in GoCast is like general Pokemon Go podcast. It's right. Like, that GoCast hosted by Chris and Kyle. <laughs> 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 right. You guys. Or just in general, like now you're getting podcasts like that's in like 30 minutes to 10 to 30 minutes with Good Morning Joe and their 10 minute daily grind podcast. Or there's Let's Go, that's a, is a, is a Pokemon Go podcast, like 30 minutes long. So it's not that hard to keep up with Pokemon Go news if you want a very quick bite sized version of it. And also, like I said, going as I said before, like podcasts are made by people who they work well on audio in the best way possible. Like, okay, I'm saying this with all with love, right? Like that's how they decide to express their Pokemon love. Some people do be art. Some people do it via words. 
you guys are doing it via spoken word. And that's saying that's hard to push out there because like e it's easy to like, retreat a piece of art, right? Or say, hey, let me go ahead and message this to, my, to a friend. They would like this, this piece of art. But it's hard to like, share podcasts unless you do via word of mouth or via a quick link. And that's how I'm here to announce as the Pokeball Trends mixtape dropping soon. Stay tuned for the tune. No, I'm not doing I'm not doing a drop tape. Well, it's been very cool to hear your experiences. One of the last ones I want to ask and talk about is your experience with Go. You've alluded to a little bit. So when did you first start playing Pokemon Go? Right before it came out. If day zero is a thing, that was a day zero player. Because of Pokemon Crossroads, I was allowed to take part in a beta of Pokemon Go. Where like I get to like, okay, play the game and then do a review for it. They they send me a link and say, like, click on this link. You get to play the beta. It was it was a really unique experience because already I was already going to the, because of Pokemon Go I was going to the park. I was going to see what Pokemon can't find in the park, what Pokemon can't find in my neighborhoods. And then when it eventually came out, I became the day one of the day one players. We're like, okay, let me go ahead. And, now that the game's officially out, let me go ahead and play and go to the park. Let me go this and that. Oh, I hear some random new place I've never been to before. Okay, cool. Let me go ahead and see what Pokemon is there. Let me spin and stop. And pretty much now Pokemon goes spin like, okay, I need to make sure I spin and stop, catch a Pokemon, and do a, a research task. If I could do those three things, great. If I could get a shiny in the meantime, even better. Mission accomplished. So I've been doing that Pokemon Go as like just a casual player. I don't sometimes I go to raids, but going to in-person raids is kind of like, uh. But if there's a Pokemon that I want, like Landorus, like I need a Landorus because that's a VGC big Pokemon, then hey, here's like, can you draw me a remote raid, please? Or do say like, Pokemon that need in the video game, then yeah, you can just do a raid for that because it's easier to catch that one than do it in a game that hasn't come out since 2015. Looking at you, um, black and white. No shade, right? No shade there. No shade. This is unless it's Pokemon Gray. This is why I keep on pushing for like re-releasing those old games somehow. I mean, they, Legend Arceus did a good job for like Landorus and them, but I still gotta play our Legend Arceus to play to get those Pokemon. Me and my Pokemon Go saying, "Hey, Landorus and raids for two weeks only." Okay, cool. That's faster. You bring up an interesting point I don't think I've ever had a chance to talk about. You know, how does a raid boss, say like Landorus, we'll use your example, factor in or play into the VGC scene? One of the issues that VGC has is that people will argue that it's not easy to get into. Mm -hmm. There's so many games. Like, if you want uh, Urshifu, you have to play the DLC for Sword and Shield. If you want Landorus in this case, you can either play a black and white game that's hard to find and expensive. You could play through Omega Ruby as a Sapphire and their Hoopa rings, similar to um, Ultra Sound Moon, where you gotta do the Space Rings, or you do Sword and Shield, where like you gotta play through all that to get to the raid dens to hopefully get lucky to find Landorus, and then then you got Legend Arceus, where you gotta play all Legend Arceus to find a Landorus there. Besides Black and White and Legend Arceus, it's luck based. You gotta get lucky to find those Pokemon and those locations and be at the right time. There's lots of things going on. They are post game content. But Pokemon Go is like, okay, I could pick up Pokemon Go, go to level 10, be, become level 10, do raids, and just wait until Pokemon Go has a Landorus raid weeks, right? It's much easier to do that. At that point, you could just transfer Landorus from Go to home, find a friend who has Landorus already, trade that Landorus to your Sky and Violet game, pay back, and then transfer Landorus to your game. It's a bit easier, in my opinion. So it sounds in a weird way that Pokemon Go is more cost effective for a VGC player to just go mm -hmm. catch a Landorus real quick, whether it be remote or in person, yeah. transfer it to home, bring it to VGC, and then they have bottle caps so they can raise whatever IVs it is, right? Exactly. It's much easier. The hardest part is waiting for Niantic to do a Landorus raids and having a friend. But the thing is, if you're playing Pokemon and you don't have friends, even somebody as antisocial as I am sometimes, have a few friends that say, hey, do you have a Landorus? Can you trade to my Scar and Bite game for like five seconds? Thanks. Because that's how I got Regideki in my game. I didn't choose Regideki in my Pokemon Sword version. So I had to go ahead and get Regideki from Pokemon Go, get a friend to trade me the Regideki for like two seconds, and then transfer Regideki to my Scar and Bite game. But it was much easier to do that than playing all of Thor and Shield again just to get Vegedeki. Well, very cool, Pokemon Crossroads. Thank you for coming on the show. I do want to finish off with the final question before we close this podcast. Okay. So if somebody comes to you and they're going to want to do a Pokemon battle six on six, what six Pokemon would you bring? Oh, man, that's hard. The... It's only six Pokemon. Yeah, that's hard. It's so hard. <laughs> like, I, want, I go all steel. Do I just go real steel on everybody and just like pick my steel favorites? Or do I pick like favorites of all time? Um, I guess Charizard. Charizard's one. I love Charizard. He's the big dragon. Just really fun to have. Metagross, that's one of my favorite stereotype type Pokemon. Just really cool. I just love how Metagross is. Like, you can flow on top of him. He's a great battler. All-time favorite. Electroire. I just like Electroire. 
I like type immunities as well. If you don't know that. Do you have a type immunity? That's great. I like it to be a big wall. So Electrify. Let's go Electrify for one. Can I go Ogre Pond Wellspring? That's fun too. I like Ogre Pond as well. Ogre Pond is really fun. Go Lurk. That Go Lurk's fun. Big Punching Boy. Just punch. Right. Punch. <laughs> ghost type. Oh man, Ghost types are fun too as well. Last it's, one. I'm going to do Fire Plume. I just like Fire Plume a lot. Ari is one of my favorite Pokemon. If you ever see me at a regional event, it's always like cover, it's always covering Oddishes. So Fire Plume. Let's go with Fire Plume. Make it easy. Pokemon Crossroads, thanks for coming on the show. Before you do go, if people want to connect with you, if they want to check out your articles, check out Pokemon Crossroads. Where can they go? By all means, please plug away. All right. So PokemonCrossroads.com is the website. If you are on Twitter or X or Hectic Cart, you go to uh, PKMN Crossroads. You can find my uh, Pokemon Musings there. We just got done talking about all the Faraday stuff. If you want personal Mikey, Mikey can be found at Mikey Zard. I would post things like, oh, this is what I'm doing this week and at my league or things like that. Thank you for listening to As the Pokeball Turns. If you want to support the show, consider becoming a Patreon by either clicking the link in the description or going to patreon.com slash as the Pokeball Turns. Now, I'm actually going to New York City Go Fest, and hopefully I get to meet every single one of you. If you meet me, make sure to get yourself a free Necrozma wristband. I'll be giving out those to everybody that I run into, so I definitely want to make sure I can give it to the people who listen to the show. If for some reason you can't make it to GoFest New York City, don't sweat it. Contact me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever have you, and let me know like, hey, David, I can't make it to GoFest. Can I still get a wristband? And I'll make sure you get one because I want to make sure that everyone who listens to this show gets one for GoFest. So please hit me up if you can't make it. Until next time.